And welcome to one of the bonus contents for It's Not Cheating, It's Ethical and Consensual Non-Monogamy, produced by Dating Kinky. And we are thrilled to have Attorney Lady Steele here tonight. Um, today, this morning, wherever you happen to be and whenever you happen to be listening or watching this, um, to talk about non-monogamy and the law, which that's a question I get a lot when, you know, I'm talking about, you know, my own non-monogamy or people are, you know, maybe thinking about dipping a toe in here or there or whatever. And, you know, they almost always have questions about this. And here in North Carolina, we've got some pretty interesting laws <laughs> that can cause quite a bit of heartache related to non-monogamy. So this is going to be really, um, I think this is going to be a useful chat for all of you out there who are interested in this, um, who have families, who have jobs, who have places that you live in children children yeah. yeah it's kind of a big deal so let's hear from lady seal let's hear she, who she is and then let's get started so tell us a bit about yourself hi thank you nookie i appreciate you uh inviting me to datingkinky.com and give me a chance to talk because you know me i like talking so <laughs> <laughs> you and me both I am the only open out and practicing BDSM and ethical non-monogamy specializing attorney in the state of Georgia, possibly in the United States, and I think definitely in the Southeast. I haven't exactly taken the temperature of every attorney out there, but I know what I do, how I advertise it, and I do seem to be the only one. Um, if there are any attorneys watching this, you want to join me in what it is I do, please. I don't like being the only one. I have a family of my own and a child to raise myself. So please come help. I will be more than glad to uh, to show you the ropes. Matter of fact, I had somebody write me about that just the other day. So I'm very excited to know that people are out there, right? Yeah, that people are out there really wanting to get involved in this because it is, for me, one of the highest levels um, of philanthropy that I can possibly do, you know, what better use that I can use put my law degree to than to help people in these communities. Um, I am barred in Georgia. So for anybody who is watching, most of my advice will come from there. If I happen to know, you know, a little bit of something as far as some other states, then I'll be more than glad to close that. Um, and if anybody has any questions, like she said, I'm attorney lady Steele on Fet Life. You can always feel free to reach out me, uh, reach out to me through there, and I'm sure enough you would be more than glad to give you my information there as well. Um, because if I don't know the answer, then I can likely get it for you. Um, I have practiced on a pro hoc vice basis, which is a case by case basis where you get temporary admission in Tennessee, Florida, Texas, Illinois, Virginia. Um, did a little bit of work in California, kind of, sort of, um, a little bit of work in New York and New Jersey, the tri-state area. So I've wandered outside of Georgia. I just have not gotten a bar card outside of Georgia. Um, and I also have to make, because of the state bar here, I also have to make something very clear. Um, nothing that I say here is to be constituted as legal advice. This does not create an attorney client relationship. Um, if you have any questions as far as the specific facts and issue in your case, please, please contact somebody uh, who is of competent legal mind in your own jurisdiction uh, for further advice. And if you want any hints on that, uh, the Kink Aware Professional List as part of the National Coalition of Sexual Freedom, uh, their website is actually wonderful. I'm, I'm listed there as a Kink Aware Professional, and I know several others that are as well. So those are my disclaimers. Now, if you want to know a little bit about me, oh, and I'll be drinking lots of water when I talk, I drink a lot of water. Um, I, as far as my ethical non-monogamy life is concerned, I have been ethically non-monogamous, well, I've been non-monogamous my whole life. Let's just <laughs> 20 and dumb, I was not so ethically non-monogamous, but let's just say for every relationship that I have had, I have had extraneous partners at one point in time or another, whether that was, you know, bringing in a third, whether it was me having a relationship outside of my primary relationship, 
whether that was unfortunately, and again, I'll be the first one to admit this, um, cheating whenever I was really young and didn't know what was going on. I didn't even know that non-monogamy was an option then. Boy, let me tell you, when I found out, I was good after that. I, I, I was good. <laughs> so um, I think a lot of people have done that who are not familiar with the ethical non-monogamy community. Um, now that I have found this community and found the ways to communicate and, and all of this, I'm, I'm much happier. I'm actually much happier. I'm currently in a relationship now. I am serving a woman. Uh, her name is Sir Amber, and she and I are engaged. And my former fiance, to whom I was engaged before I came out, uh, Master Inferno, who was also my former master as well, uh, we are in a daddy-girl relationship, and all three of us are nesting partners, and we live in this wonderful house here, at least for another week before we move. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that's fun during COVID, yay. Um, and we co-parent uh, my son, whose father was from a prior relationship prior to Master Inferno. So we're all one big polycule happy type family, so most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it usually works. I mean, families are happy. Oh yeah, most of the time. Most of the time, <laughs> most of the time. And, you know, it's it's it's, it's a thing. One of, the, one of the bonuses we're working on organizing is um, non-monogamy and children, where yeah. Yeah. we're going to have not only parents but then adult children of those parents to talk about what it was like to be raised yeah. non-monogamous. And I'm one of those. I, I was like in on that. Yeah, because see, how I was raised, I was raised by beatniks who were young oh, yeah. kids that then evolved into hippies. But the second they had kids, you know, my mom got very conservative. But before that, they were married for 10 years. And before marriage, they were together for three or four. And so, you know, when they got together, they I, there was you know, this aunt and uncle that we'd go and visit. And then we oh, had sure. another aunt and uncle we would visit. And, you know, we're not blood related, but, you know, we're all family. And I was like, okay, cool. And as I got older, I started seeing things. Yeah. <laughs> going, oh, <laughs> I need to know that about my parents. But really I did, you know. Um, it took me far too long to yeah. like connect the dots. Because right. That's right, right, right. Like, this is normal, right? Like this is how people live. Oh, 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 yeah. And then all of a sudden you're like, you're like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> so whenever you were talking about having a lesbian experience, that's who you had it with. You know, it's like, oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> and it wasn't that long ago. Got it. Right. Got exactly. It. exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, I had um, some eye opening type things and then later on you know it's funny because the older my parents got the more uh conservative they got like i said and then like whenever i came out to myself as bisexual and whenever i was like 18 years old you know my mom was very open about you know her bisexual experiences and i was like uh, oh you know and 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 but then the older they got they kind of forgot you know, they, they, they like have amnesia. And I'm like, hmm, I don't think that's how that works. And so whenever I started dating a woman full time about 10 years ago, you know, my parents were like, or my mom was like, you know, oh, what would the family think and all this? And they see it on Facebook. I said, well, you can tell them to come and have a conversation with me if they have questions. And I'll be more than glad to answer them. And yeah. then whenever I came out as lesbian, you know, not bisexual, not pansexual like I was for years, but lesbian um back in november and i brought sir to you know christmas dinner <laughs> it's like hi guess who i'm bringing and by the way robert's coming too because they love robert you know <laughs> they love robert but i'm like yeah he's coming too with the grandchild so yeah yeah i've i've had those experiences <laughs> as well so yeah yeah. And I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating, but you really, when it comes right down to it, you know, there are times when you're like, yeah, you go parents. And then there are times like as a kid when you're like, oh, if only they'd be more normal. Yo, or cooler. <laughs> I wish my parents were cooler. Oh, but you know. <laughs> you know. I, I was totally on <laughs> myself, so I really couldn't, yeah. I couldn't. Yeah. They couldn't be cooler. It was, they were, they were cooler than I was. That was, <laughs> 
You know, I always had the cool parents and that was something that my friends always said, you know, that, that you have the coolest parents. and in backwater Alabama where I was raised, that was probably true. But like I said, those interesting little tidbits, you know, I didn't connect the dots until I got into college and then I was like, oh, then what I'm doing is fine, you know, and mom and dad can do it back in the 60s. I'm fine, you know, so. Absolutely. Okay, so I wanted to just kind of reiterate now obviously uh attorney lady steel is not going to be giving legal advice correct what we are going to be doing here this evening and correct me if i if i word any of this in a way that's going to put you in any jeopardy but what we are going to be doing this evening is talking about the types of things mm -hmm. you should be looking to your local laws lawmakers and attorneys to find out about Absolutely. And move forward creating a non monogamous lifestyle with one or multiple partners. Yes. Um, so think of this as kind of like a checklist of things that she knows you might want to be aware of that could cause potential challenges in the future. Because awareness is key. I think a lot of people um, want to stay out of trouble as much mm -hmm. as possible, um, but they don't know what they don't know. And I, yeah. that's why um, this particular uh, webinar, seminar, class, discussion, chat, um, mm -hmm. vid thing we're doing <laughs> is so important is because, you know, uh, it's kind of like a big ball of string and you got to find the little thread at the end to pull to unravel the ball of string. And right. If people don't know how to find that little thread, then, you know, they're never going to be able to to set themselves on the right path. And that's why I think discussions like these need to be had as, as frequently and often as possible, honestly. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so it, for what are the four things? Because I know that you have like four primary things that um, could pop up as overall or overarching umbrella issues in non-monogamy. There's a lot of areas that non-monogamy can touch. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the four biggest ones that one should be concerned with, and, and especially this first one, is your estate planning. Uh, you know, and people are like, oh, well, I'm broke. I don't have an estate. Whenever lawyers use the term estate planning, we mean if you have two cents, you need to let the state know where you want those two cents to go whenever you pass. Um, so property is very important as, as a part of that, but also end of life planning is a part of that. Um, elder care, whenever you become an elder, hopefully, you know, my mouth to God's ears, um, you know, that sort of planning is important. Um, and I think the the second most important area of law is family law, because mm -hmm. if you end up getting a divorce after being ethically non-monogamous, there are a lot of states that still have laws in regards to adultery, bigamy, things of that nature. And if they don't understand what's going on, the judges, or God forbid jury, if you have a jury trial and a divorce, then, you know, you could end up being sunk, not just with your money, but also with your kids. And that's the part, you know, that, that always scares people the most as well it should. Mm -hmm. have, uh, and then you get into some of the more lesser known areas like criminal law. Um, in some states, some of this that we do is still criminal. I mean, you know, I stand up in my BDSM in the law class and the first thing that comes out of my mouth is everything we do is illegal. Now, <laughs> now that we've said this, let's, <laughs> let's kind of back away from that and see what we can do to, to get your head screwed on straight about it. But yeah, um, there is some things, some, some things that can be, uh, criminally actionable. And I think people should be aware of that. Um, and then in the, the final area and one that people usually don't think about is landlord tenant law. Mm -hmm. And I can get into a little more detail um, on that, but yeah, the, even with what it is we do in this particular lifestyle, the non-monogamy, ethical non-monogamy, E&M, as I call it, mm -hmm. lifestyle, um, you absolutely can run afoul of landlord uh, tenant issues. Um, especially if you're on the tenant side. So that's something that we can talk about tonight if you'd like. Yeah, I think that the, it's definitely, again, all of, I think all of these things are important to sort of touch on, again, just so that people can be aware. You know, what was that? Knowledge is power. And Knowledge now we know. Power. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that was a rainbow, by the way. The more you know. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I like that. It's... <laughs> right. Um, so okay, so let's start with estate planning. So, you know, I am I immediately think of okay, I don't really have all that much, but you know, I've got a cat and I've got this business and you know, where would I want those things to go? So I guess that means wills. Yes. Yes. Um, the most important part of estate planning is having a will, because if you, uh, as far as end of life plans are concerned, um, I have a very special place in my heart as far as medical power of attorneys and things of that nature, but we'll get to that. Oh, later. Sure. Yeah. Um, but if you die without a will, it's called dying in test state. And the state will still determine where your things go, but it may not be to the place that you want. Mm -hmm. And so like, for example, uh, in my particular jurisdiction in Georgia, if you die intestate, then your spouse gets what's called the widow share, which is a 50% share. And then they go down the line first. So what that means is you're here down the, the, inheritance line, so to speak, and that's your kids or your mm -hmm. grandkids, so on and so forth. Now, if there's no one else, like say you died married with no kids, your spouse gets half and usually they get the other half at that point. If your parents or aunts, uncles, and cousins want to make some sort of claim, they can. Mm -hmm. um, and think about how scary that is, right? So mm -hmm. if somebody is dying without a will, you know, say they have a, a hundred thousand dollar house that's worth a hundred thousand dollars. The spouse, you know, can sell it and get a 50% or have a 50% interest in it. And if any of these other parents or cousins or kids or whatever wants to come up and make a claim, then they absolutely can. And so, you know, that's kind of scary. That's, right. that's very scary because, you know, hopefully you want your spouse to have, you know, their share. Hopefully you want your kids to have it, but you know, right. what if you're grown up and you've had a falling out with your kids? You know, I talk about this case all the time. Whenever I was young, first started, um, I was a baby attorney, you know, and this was not even a, a ethical non-monogamy case or a um, BDSM case. It was just a woman who fought cancer forever and ever and ever. And her and her sister owned a florist business. Well, the woman who was dying, she had a biological son. Now, she was not married to his father anymore, hadn't been for years. But because whenever you divorce, at least in Georgia, any will involving your spouse where they inherit anything is automatically null and void. So you're legally divorced. You don't have anything to worry about. So she was concerned that her drug addict son would get the florist business away from his, her sister, or at least her share of it. And so what we did, because we knew she was going to pass, um, we made sure that everything was transferred over to the sister's name and that a will was written very specifically disinheriting the son and all of this other stuff. But, you know, that's not dissimilar to what happens in a polyamorous situation where you might be legally married to somebody, but you might have other partners that you want to make sure is taken care of. But they have no legal standing whenever you die, unless there is a will that says that they do. So please, please make sure that you go to someone, again, competent in your jurisdiction and have your will updated because I, I cannot stress enough how important that is. I mean, if it's not, if it's not in existence, please have it come into existence. Um, and something else you should know is that if you die in test state, again, without a will and you have property left over, the government will search. And I mean, search girl, you hear me search. For anybody. <laughs> you might accidentally be related to, to give your property to, because if all else fails, it actually goes to the state and they don't want to have to handle that, you know, because it's a touch subject. I totally get that. And so they do their best to ensure that they find somebody. So it could be your great grand niece down the line, you know, who has some sort of moral objection to what it is that, I was about to say that wasn't me. Um, <laughs> all noise making devices during the course of the class. I'm kidding. Um, 
So, yeah, there may be some great grandniece down the way who you may not have even heard of or even worse, you have heard of. They didn't approve of your life and what it is that you did. And now they end up with whatever it is that you may have, no matter how small that is. Right. And so that's something that you need to be um, aware of. Um, in most jurisdictions, you can negatively disinherit somebody. What that means is that you can specifically say, I do not want any of my stuff to go to this person. You know, parents that were judgmental, um, children that were judgmental, you know, grandparents that are just, you know, that are, are totally judgmental. Um, so if there is somebody that you are wanting to make sure they get nothing, please state that in your will. And the lawyer that you go to in your particular state will know how to do that if that's possible in your state. In Georgia, it is. And I know in New York that it is. Right, right, right. So real quick, one of the things that you're, you're touching on um, or that you have touched on is the, the idea of married versus non-married. And maybe you're going to get into this in the family thing. But as I understand it, and again, correct me if I say any of this wrong, marriage is essentially, it's like a, a shorthand label for a bunch of contracts that essentially puts power into various hands and so on and so forth. So with non-monogamy, what you really want to do is you want to think through all of those different contracts and put the things into the appropriate hands based on where you want them to belong. Yes. Whether it's, it's will or, you know, end of life medical care or whatever, you, you need to make sure that with marriage, you know, that's kind of like all assumed and taken care of. Mm -hmm. But knowing what marriage involves can help you determine what you want for your non-monogamous other partners or it's, partners that you're not married to. Yeah. It's very important that you consult uh, your state's local, your, your local state's laws in regards to what percentage your spouse gets mm -hmm. in the event. Again, you don't want them to get that percentage without a will. And yet marriage, you know, of course, marriage, can be a lot of things to a lot of people. But whenever we're talking about from a legal perspective, yes, it is a series of contracts. Yes, it is a series of um, laws that get established between two people of, you know, certain contractual obligations that you do have. And right. so if you're going to have marriage to one of your partners, because no, uh, uh, multiple marriages are not allowed um, as of yet, I think now that we have marriage equality, um, in regards to uh, gender and sex, then I think we're going to be moving in the direction of polyamory. Mm -hmm. not, not in like next year, near future, especially not with the, uh, the political climate the way it is now, but I do believe it's coming. I believe the dialogue is open and I absolutely believe that it is coming down the pipe. So until it does, the best way for you to protect uh, your family, your poly family or your non-monogamous family um, in regards to who gets what whenever you pass, um, again, estate planning, use mm -hmm. trusts, you know, trusts are very important. Um, if you want, if you have a certain sum of money or an asset that you want um, to sort of be administered while uh, the, the other person is in possession of it, you know, you don't have to have um, people that you know to be those trustees. Um, same things goes with the executors of a will. Whenever you, you pass away, somebody has to execute or be the executor for the will. And a lot of people, especially in poly situations, are real hesitant to name, you know, this partner or that partner's and the other partner's going to feel like that they were left out or, you know, something like okay. that. Um, so learn, you know, turn to your bankers, your lawyers, your friends, um, and maybe your partners. You know, some people might have a business head. You know, in my particular example, um, in my life currently right now, my medical decisions are made by Master Inferno because he's an EMT firefighter and he's been with me over the last five years, either as a friend or as a partner. Um, he knows a lot more about it than Sir Amber does. Um, mm -hmm. I take care of all of Sir Amber's paperwork because it's something that, you know, doesn't really click in her head. She's got, you know, trauma based around doing paperwork and all of this. It's a whole story. Um, but so what I, I'm trying to say is play to your, all of your partner's strengths, you know, yeah. if you believe that you have a partner that will pull the plug. If that's what you want, no matter what it is they're feeling at the time, pick that person as, you know, your medical power of attorney or your healthcare director. 
Um, right. But if you don't have that, um, then yeah, absolutely look outside of your circle and let them know, you know, let your partners know this isn't anything personal. It's just that I have to know that this is going to be done for me whenever the time comes. Right. Um, and, you know, make sure that you pick more than one executor for your will. You know, people think, okay, I'm going to have this partner. Cool. That's, that's all I'm going to have, this partner. No, 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 no. Oh, please, for all that is holy, have about four or five, you know, because if this person is dead or dying or unavailable, then you want them to go to the next, to the next, to the next, mm -hmm. because you don't want a court to appoint an administrator over your will because they might not be poly friendly. They might not understand what's going on and they might end up giving something to your family of origin. If there's something obscure in your will, as opposed to your, your poly family and mm -hmm. you just don't want that to happen. So like I said, have backup upon backup upon backup. Um, that's the most important thing that you can do whenever it comes to naming an executor. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, that makes sense. So, I mean, the, honestly, and, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist or anything like that, but honestly, I think the last people that I would want, you know, figuring out my shit after I'm dead is the government. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So taking every every step possible to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah, like smart absolutely. Yeah, I'm um, so... When it comes to like estate value, I mean, how is that even figured out? I mean, I'm guessing, you know, oh, well, you can tot up, you know, well, this furniture goes to people and, you know, you have this much in your, you know, savings account or whatever. But, but what other things do you need to consider when you're deciding on, you know, how this is going to get spread out? Yeah. And this kind of goes into elder care, which is definitely not my specialty. Um, but we can definitely touch on it so you can get to somebody who can talk more about it. Um, something that you really need to keep in mind is that debts count against your estate's value. I cannot say that enough. I will say it again. Debts, even medical expenses can count against the value of your estate. That's why when you're young and healthy, invest in a life ins a whole life insurance policy that you can constantly throw money into and not only is that a great credit reference, it's an investment tool. It's also a savings account. And in the end, whenever you, uh, you know, possibly get sick, you might not be insurable at that particular point in time. Uh, right. So that's why it's important to get it while you can before you fall ill and you're not insurable anymore as far as life insurance is concerned. Um, but there is such a thing as order of debts that are paid off out of your estate before anything else is, is um, distributed to your beneficiaries. Um, the first thing that comes out is funeral expenses, reasonable mm -hmm. funeral expenses, not, you know, anything terribly up in the trees. But reasonable funeral expenses always come out of the estate first because uh, mm -hmm. they don't want anybody being stuck with that. Um, the costs and expenses of the administration of the estate. Remember the executors we were talking about and the trustees? Those are the folks they actually can get and do get paid for their services to the estate. Um, uh, then your own personal debts and taxes start coming out with preference under federal law and the laws of the state. So if you owe the IRS and you owe the state of Georgia, whatever state you live in, IRS gets paid first, then the state that you're in. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the tax man cometh always, <laughs> like it or not. Um, reasonable medical and hospital expenses um, of the last illness of the last illness of the person who has passed or the decedent. Um, so I, I'm a four time cancer survivor, and let's say I had debt, which fortunately I don't. I'm very lucky. I have great insurance. Um, but let's say I'd had uh, you know, for the last two bouts with cancer, I had medical expenses. Well, the bill collectors can only come for the one that killed me, not the ones that I had prior to that. So right. for the recent expense, um, and if you are on Medicaid, they will come after your assets. Mm -hmm. so that is at, that's a time whenever you need to see an elder care lawyer and let them know, hey, I'm on Medicaid, um, you know, 
what, how can I best protect my assets uh, in the event of my death? Um, and then after that, there's judgments that were entered against the, uh, the decedent according to their priorities, bankruptcy terms. What that basically means is that uh, if you are sued because you uh, caused a car accident and there's a judgment as a result of it, you know, that will have a lower priority than if you murdered somebody and there was a judgment against you, believe it or not. That's true. Um, you know, child support claims that right. all judgments that you have against you have an order of um, priority and the probate court would sort that all out. Um, and then all other claims after that, if people were to come up and, and step forward and say, hey, I don't have a judgment, but I'm the credit card company and they owe me $10,000, I want my share. Now, right. do credit card companies do that? Most of the time they don't because they don't want the bad press. Right. You, right. you want the honest truth? They don't want the bad press. And so most of the time they most of the time they don't come after you. I don't want to, I, I never speak in absolutes. Um, nothing in this world is black and white. Everything really is 50 shades. Come to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Much too artist made sometimes. Right. Especially whenever it comes to the practice of law, um, there are all of the gradations. Um, so I don't like to say, you know, oh, you never have to worry about credit card debt. You know, you can die with your credit card debt or student loan debt. It'll be fine. They're supposed to write it off, especially student loan debt, but that doesn't necessarily mean they will. So um, if you're, you know, if you're physically able to get life insurance policies, get one that nobody knows about. And the entire purpose is for all of the, uh, the, the proceeds to go into a trust account to pay your debts if, you know, you're in a position where debts are going to be a problem. Because you don't want the people that you leave behind who care about you, you know, having to worry about this. I mean, what an absolutely yeah. horrible thing. Um, and again, that's where trust, uh, that's where trust comes in regards to the, the best way to ensure that your beneficiaries get what it is that you want them to get. And, you know, your bills are paid. You can set up um, revocable trust and irrevocable trust. Um, an irrevocable trust is where you don't have a lot of power over it while you're still alive but there's less taxes that the beneficiary has to pay in the end. Um, whenever they do finally get, you know, the funds or the property or whatever that's in it. Um, and you can also set up a revocable trust, which is where you maintain more control over your lifetime while you're still alive over it, but there's going to be more taxes in the end for the person that actually inherits. So if you want to keep a revocable trust, I always advise people, you know, put extra in there to help pay for the taxes in the end. Um, so that's some of the best way to avoid not having a will, mm -hmm. um, but really in the end, the, the goal is to avoid probate as much as possible. Um, so you can, uh, and I, I personally love this particular law. Um, you have joint owners with rights of survivorship whenever it comes to things like cars houses. This comes in really handy whenever you're polyamorous because a lot of states will allow multiples. Mm, sure. Yeah. So let's say I buy a car and I buy cash money, right? Mm -hmm. Cash, don't have to worry about a lien hold or anything like that. And I can make J-O-W-S, joint owner with survivorship. If you see those four letters, J-O-W-S, on the title on a car, you'll know what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, I did this with uh, my son's father. We, we had joint ownership with rights of survivorship. So we were legally married at the time as well. Because yeah. Now let's stop there for a second. Just because you're married does not mean you are joint owners with rights of survivorship in regards to your property, your bank accounts, or anything else. Now, this designation can be made on a lot of things. Real, real estate, um, mm -hmm. automobiles, bank accounts. But it doesn't automatically occur just because you're married. You know, a lot of things changed after the Terry Chavo case where, um, for those of you who may not be old enough to remember, there was a case in Florida that it had to be what, Nookie, probably 15, 16? Yeah, I think in like 15 to, 15 to 20, somewhere in that. Yeah, um, where a woman was in a persistent vegetative state 
and she lived in Florida and she didn't have a will and she was married. And so her husband said she wouldn't want to live like this. I'm going to pull the plug. But her parents were like, oh, she would want to fight it to the nail. You're not going to pull the plug. The parents sued and actually got the right to say whether or not the plug was going to be pulled by her parents because there was rumors that the husband was cheating and they were about to divorce. And, right. And again, if she would have had a medical power of attorney and if she would have had the right estate documents, none of this would have been an issue where it says, I want the plug to be pulled. I don't yeah. care if I'm married or divorced or separated or whatever the case may be, or I don't, you know, um, but just like, like I said, I'll, I'll get into that as far as in, in just a second. But as far as making things easier to avoid probate, what a joint ownership with right of survivorship will do. Like if I, like I said, I bought a car and I put Sir Amber and Master Inferno's name on it. Then whenever I die, they get an equal split of my third. Okay. So basically their third becomes a half. Yeah. If it was just Amber and me, then whenever I died, then she would be the sole owner of the car. You don't have to go through probate. You don't have to get letters of testamentary. You don't have to get any of that stuff. You take the title to the, the tag place and go, here's the death certificate. So now I want to transfer this title over into my name. And that makes it so much easier, so much easier. Um, that's a, a wonderful thing that one can do. Um, you can also transfer property before you die. And again, I gave my, my friend's example. Um, she gave away everything before she died, which is a nice thing to do and an easy thing to do if you know it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I'm a four-time cancer survivor. If I got if it went metastatic or something, if it came back, it wouldn't be that much of a surprise. I'd start giving things away. <laughs> I mean, I'll be honest with you. Um, I put everything in a trust for my son and I put everything in, uh, you know, sign titles over and all this other stuff. So, you know, done and done. Um, but if you have the, the luxury, I guess, <laughs> sounds kind of cruel and harsh. But if you know in advance that that's going to happen, then, yeah, absolutely do that. You know, um, and you can um, make sure that the, in your will, you know, you say upon my death. You know, this person gets this and this. And don't be afraid. Do not be afraid to, you know, take this bottle cap and put it in your will if that bottle cap is meaningful to you. Because you That's never... our bottle cap. <laughs> right, maybe. Maybe you want the bottle cap. I don't know. <laughs> you know, but usually in a will, there is what is called a pour over um, section or a pour, pour over uh, uh, paragraph. Um, sentence statement in it that says anything I don't name specifically, right? This person gets my spouse gets my child gets whatever you know, um, which is good. So make sure that your will is written well and has a pour over um, uh, statement in that. I'm trying to stay away from Georgia specific language. So a statement, a paragraph, a something, a right. something um, that says that. Um, because in the absence of that, then the courts will treat it as if you died in test state and then the sharks can come and, and feed off of it again. And you don't want that. Um, now, as far as end of life decisions, not your property is concerned. Let's have a word about living wills, medical powers of attorney, healthcare proxies, um, and financial power of attorneys, durable, and, and general power of attorneys. Okay. Well, for the Terry Chavo case, every state had a living will and a medical power of attorney as separate. So then mm -hmm. you got to decide who your health care proxy was and your medical power of attorney. But your living will said, okay, whoever is this person, this is what I want them to do. Mm-hmm. I would say a good half of the states still do that. Georgia, for one, is not one of them. In New York, New York is one of them. So in Georgia, what took over after the, the living will and the medical power of attorney and healthcare proxy went away was um, called an advanced directive for care. Uh, you can download one from the internet. Mm -hmm. you know, 
Google Advanced Directive for Healthcare Georgia or North Carolina or wherever, um, download it and fill it out. If you go into the hospital, a lot of hospitals will have just a pre, uh, like a boilerplate form that you can fill out. And that handles saying who your healthcare director is. It's not a healthcare mm -hmm. proxy, proxy in that case. It's a healthcare director is and what you want to do in the event of a persistent vegetative state, um, you know, if you need a feeding tube, if, you know, whatever the case may be, it handles it in one document as opposed to do two documents the way it was before. Now, I cannot say this enough. If you are in an ethical non-monogamous relationship and you have a polycule, get you some healthcare documents because even though you are married, that does not give your spouse the right to come in and do anything with your health. Not since the Terry Shavo case. Yeah. So it doesn't yeah. matter if you're married because your spouse and your poly partner have equal rights, which is none as far as that's concerned. If you have not designated it, it usually goes to the next of kin. And by next of kin, I don't mean spouse mm -hmm. that be adult children. Well, it's like the line of testament or, uh, of inheritance, right? First, you go to your kids and your grandkids if they're of age, and then it goes up to your parents. And if your parents are dead or your grandparents are dead, then it goes out to your nieces and your nephews and your uncles and your aunts and all of these people who may not approve of what it is that you're doing. So as vitally important as a will is, and it is, an advanced directive for health care or, and or a medical power of attorney, um, health care proxy and a living will is so important. I cannot stress that enough. Um, I get a lot of questions about, well, what happens if I move? What if I go from one state to the next? You know, any attorney can write a will in general terms, you know? So like if you absolutely insisted on wanting me to write your will, but you lived in Texas, that's fine. I could write the general tenants for you. Then you just take it to a Texas attorney to kind of, you know, give their blessing on it and, 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 notarize it and do all the things that's required there. Right. <laughs> so, you know, do the things and all's good. Um, so if you have a will from one state, yeah, when you move to another state, get it transferred over to that state, that state. But don't panic if you don't. If you have an advanced director for healthcare in Georgia and you go to, to New York, as long as all the people are present for it, they're going to they're going to honor the ADHC. Yeah. Of healthcare. Um, but yeah, but make sure that you get that changed over as much as possible. Um, and as far as estate planning is concerned, the only other tip that I can give, especially for uh, ethical non-monogamous folks, is renew. Look at your estate plan yearly. You know, a lot of people like to do it in the new year. Some people think that's a little morbid. Fine. Pick a random day in June. I don't care. <laughs> Whenever it is, you know, August, July, who cares? Um, make sure that you pick a time every year to renew it because relationships change, relationships dissolve, relationships form. Mm -hmm. And you want to make sure everybody's taken care of. You know, I always tell people if you can shoulder the burden of going over your estate plan after a breakup, you know, if you're not too terribly torn up about it, or even if you are, you know, if you're practical like that, then absolutely please do it because people don't think about that. You know, they get hung up in the, the, the angst as far as what's going on. And there's nothing wrong with that. Everybody processes in their different ways, but then they have a will that gives somebody something that you don't want them to have anymore. And so, you know, whenever you break up, I beseech you within a month to revisit that plan but in the absence of that, absolutely renew it every year. Absolutely renew it every year. Wow. I feel like we've already gotten a full class. And we've only got <laughs> I have a class that is a state plan in Bali. Just, <laughs> yeah. Woo. Okay. So um, what is our next topic? Family. Family law. Fortunately, not, the, the other three topics are not as expansive as the wills. <laughs> so basically what you need to know in regards to polyamory, um, let's first touch on the concept of common law marriage. A lot of people ask, you know, if I shack up with my honeys 
which one am I common law married to? Well, unless you live in, I think there's 10 states. Um, the list is like Colorado, Iowa, Kansas, Montana, Rhode Island. I know Texas has it. I think Utah, I'm surprised there. Um, and like Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico or something. I don't even know. Um, then they're the only states that allow common law marriage anymore anyway. Check your local jurisdiction as re in regards to what the requirements are. Um, I know in Texas, you have to cohabitate, put yourself out to two different people, like the spouse and spouse has to put themselves out um, as being married to two different people. And they have to have like a bank account or a, a mortgage or something like that together. Mm -hmm. um, and so check your local jurisdiction and if you live in one of those states or one of those um, areas and, uh, and make sure that you don't accidentally fall into something you don't want. You know, that's very, mm -hmm. excuse yeah, me, gonna, that's very common when it comes to children born out of wedlock. You know, a lot of people don't think about the fact that they're common law married until they break up and somebody wants visitation and somebody wants child support. And then you go, oh, hey, we have common law marriage here. So, hey, yo, we got to get divorced. Um, that actually happened to my one of my exes is um, they lived in Texas and they had a child born out of wedlock. And then all of a sudden child support popped up and visitation popped up. And they had to go to court and get a legal divorce, whereupon in that divorce, custody, visitation, child support, and all that was established. Um, so really, common law marriage really isn't a thing, isn't really made a thing until something happens that makes it a thing. Does that make sense? Oh, you know, sure. I mean, it, it sounds to me like a lot of this is planned. You know, it's kind of like it's kind of like life. You know, don't just allow it to happen. Oof. Plan. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, this is really one of those situations where an ounce of prevention is worth a million pounds of cure. I sure. mean, seriously, if you can if you do just a tiny bit of adulting, you can avoid a whole lot of drama. As but adulting is so hard. Um. Oh, something else for those of you all that are in the military. First of all, thank you for your service. Um, but the Uniform Code of Military Justice also says that um, that you common law marriage can be a thing for the purposes of getting court martialed under bigamy laws. So be careful of that. Um, you know, I always talk about this case. Well, let's get into criminal stuff. We'll get to that in a second. Um, so as far as marriage and divorce is concerned. Um, you know, when the Defense of Marriage Act was struck down in 2013, that meant that, you know, people were starting to broaden their horizons in regards to what did marriage cover. And that's why I say, you know, I think that gives us uh, E&M people a lot of hope that that could be, you know, a thing in the future. Right. Uh, and people like to say, well, you know, what about Utah? They have sister wives there. Look at the television show. Yeah, but look, even in the television show, they had to flee to Nevada. So, mm -hmm. you know, they had to go to that was more liberal. So, again, be careful where you live and what laws you might run afoul of. Um, like adultery, you know, there are, that is a affirmative ground for divorce. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that's something you have to prove. But if you do in Georgia, um, then you, that can cost you visitation with your kids. That can cost you custody of your kids. That can cost you some of your assets. You might get children with more of the liabilities, whereas it might have been a 50-50 split before. Now maybe it's a 60-40. Um, mm -hmm. And just because everybody consented during the course of the marriage, hear me and hear me well. Some judges don't care. Some right. judges say, well, the person who you were cheating on with this other person finally came to their senses about this poly thing. And right. then you're stuck, you end up losing your kids, your house, you know, whatever. Um, it can be difficult to prove, especially if you've got text messages and emails and all of this stuff where everybody was consenting. But guess what? There are some judges that just don't care. And God forbid you get in front of a jury 
at a jury trial for a uh, divorce and the jurors don't understand. You know, that's mm -hmm. that and that could end up you could get a very, you know, bad result from that. Um, the good news is, though, is that some states, not all, I know New York and Georgia both, have um, defenses to a charge of adultery mm. in Georgia. It's called uh, condemnation and forgiveness. Excuse me, my brain flipped for a second. And what that means is, say um, Amber and I are married and then Robert and I have sex and it was outside of the agreement of the marriage, you know, I committed adultery. Cool. Well, not cool, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, and she finds out about it. Then she and I have sex again. As far as the laws of the state of Georgia is concerned, she condoned it. She forgave it based upon the new sexual act between she and I. She can't sue me for adultery. So it's like re like consecrating the original relationship. The marriage right? bond, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And I had a client whenever I was a baby lawyer again. Um, he was an NFL football player. She was the football wife, exactly what you see on TV, you know, and the wife was our client. He would go out on the road, strip everything that threw it at him, and then would come home, cook her a nice steak dinner, put the moves on her. She would let him. You know, and now she's raising cane with him over text messages. My God, the text messages. You know, about how he was out screwing around on her when he was on the road, you know, blah, 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 all this. But then he'd come home mm -hmm. and yeah. turn literal panties off of her. And, well, that's what happens. And so she we, we, we were, she was trying to get alimony. She was trying to get all this. And we're like, God, stop sleeping with them. You know, because... <laughs> If this is what you want, you're actively working against it. You know, that's another thing. A divorce might not even be granted in Georgia if you're still having sex with your soon-to-be former spouse. Oh, wow. Because as far as they're concerned, that is not legal separation. Now, you can sleep in the same bed in a house. And as long as you're not having sex, Georgia considers that a legal separation. Woo. You could be living in another house. I think mean, there's a lot of legally separated couples that don't know that. Right. Right. <laughs> and you could be living in a house three cities over. And if every time you see each other, you're having sex, still not legally separated. Oh, yeah. So separation isn't about physical proximity in Georgia. It's about genital proximity. <laughs> Let's just say. I know, right? Uh, I hate to be crass, but that's pretty much it. I'm crass all the time. It's just that's just funny to me, the the physical versus the genital proximity. Yeah. And I was kind of proud of Georgia for allowing those that defense. I thought that was pretty progressive until I did some research in New York Law for a class of mine. And they have like all sorts of exceptions like collusion like if one spouse if the plaintiff's spouse you know agreed to the cheating um you know like consenting to an open marriage or if they you know procured the person for them to sleep with um yeah. my kind of spouse <laughs> condemnation, um is a thing there it's kind of like the condemnation forgiveness in georgia where if you find out about it you know, and you continue living with the person. But even in New York, sex doesn't have to be involved. Let's say you're young in your marriage and you find out about an affair and then 20 years down the road, you decide to get divorced and say, oh, adultery, can't point at adultery because, well, you lived with them for 20 years after that, you'd forgive right. them of that at that point. Um, and then of course, it's the concept of unclean hands recrimination. If you go into a New York court saying, Oh, they committed adultery and they go, Oh, so did you. Then that sort of eviscerates a claim there. So again, mm -hmm. check with your local laws. Um, and, and I cannot stress this enough. Make sure you know what you're getting into if you're doing legal marriage or if you have to be common law marriage. Um, and again, how can this affect the divorce custody and visitation issues in Georgia is the best interest of the child standard. If a judge thinks that you having this open relationship is not to the benefit of the child, you know, they might even allow, a, you know, uh, a charge or a count or a, a, they might allow adultery to be one of the grounds for divorce. And you might end up 
you know, losing something a whole lot more than what you, you know, don't want to lose like your kids. Now, Georgia, what can be done? You can have alternatives to marriage. And I'm going to say this is going to be the case in a lot of states, meaning domestic partnership agreements. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now that equality is a thing, domestic partnership agreements now can be, now can occur between all combinations of gender or non-gender or non-binary or or agender um, individuals. Because before it was just saved for same gender relationships. But now that there's marriage equality, anybody can have a domestic partnership relationship if they are available. Now in Georgia, a lot of times, domestic partnership uh, agreements are not available. Like if you want to get one to get on your partner's insurance or something, um, a lot of the times that's not allowed because as far as they're concerned, marriage is allowed. So why don't you get married, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. So check your local jurisdiction for that particular law. Um, you can form a business, <laughs> excuse me, amongst all of your partners. Um, I would recommend an LLC or something simple like that. Cause you don't have to worry about, you know, taxes and who you're paying as employees and all this other stuff. But if you form a business, businesses can buy real estate where sometimes multiple people cannot. Now, okay. Okay. Now, Great that can and will allow multiple people on a mortgage. To me, it just makes sense. Why would you not allow multiple people on mortgages? That's more adults, theoretically, with more income, theoretically, to pay the house note, theoretically. (laughs) (laughs) Things with, I mean, credit card debt, any of that. Yeah. Uh, But again, mind your own jurisdiction. There's, um, oh gosh, I, I forget the name of the bank, but it's the one that allows the, the purchase of rural property and farmland. They allow multiple people to be on a merit, uh, on a mortgage. Um, but if you're, a, if you're in a jurisdiction where the banks won't allow that, you know, they're busting your balls, giving you a hard time for a business in the absence of marriage. Um, now in the presence of marriage, you can have a prenuptial agreement or a postnuptial agreement. Not all jurisdictions honor postnuptial agreements. I know Georgia does. Mm-hmm. So keep that in mind um, that you can enter uh, just, you know, because a lot of people come to me and go, well, we weren't open or poly whenever we first got married, but now we are. Now what? Look into a, a, a postnuptial agreement. Um, like I said, in Georgia, they're honored equally. Just make sure that they're written, written well. You mm-hmm. have called a self-executing affidavit, um, which means you have an affidavit at the end that says, yes, I'm well aware of everything that I said, uh, or a self-affirming affidavit, where you have like a notary sign the signature that says that you know what you were doing, and then the notary saying you know what you were doing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and state plan you know, with that, or a family law, a good family law attorney can, um, because it's absolutely, I believe, essential to have a prenuptial agreement if you know or contemplate or even thinking about being poly. I know whenever Sir Amber and I get married, we're absolutely having a prenuptial agreement um, for several different reasons, but also because, you know, she has assets to protect. I have assets to protect. Um, and I don't ever want us being non-monogamous to end up being an issue. And so the easiest thing that you can do is just get a, a prenup that says, you know, I, we both agree that we will never sue based upon these grounds. So that, that brings up um, an interesting topic that I know here in North Carolina, it, it's a bit archaic, but we have alienation of affection laws. Absolutely. So would the prenup or would a prenup in general, not necessarily specifically, because of course this is not legal advice, but would a prenup in general override something like an alienation of affection consideration let me explain what an alienation of affection claim is yeah (laughs) because the answer is no a prenup has nothing to do with that Um, so what an alienation uh, an alienation of affection claim is in civil court so that's the fifth area of law um that so we're kind of going off over here for a minute and i'm perfectly okay with that um so alienation of affection is where two people are married this person cheats 
this person sues the master or the mistress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a prenup could not prevent that because the prenup is between these two people and has nothing to do with this person over here. That's, that's kind of what I was figuring. It was just, yeah. you know, it's one of those things that I think is important for people to also, you know, keep in mind because if you're in a non-monogamous relationship of some sort and, you know, your original marriage fails, your other partner or partners in a state like North Carolina could be at financial risk. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, a lot of that was going on. Uh, you might remember this from the eighties or the, the early nineties where a lot of the stockbrokers who were jumping out of windows, they had life insurance policies that didn't name their wife or children. As um, the it was the mistresses um, or these other parties or the masters um, or these other parties. And so then the spouses came back and were like suing. I want that life insurance policy and, you know, applause to the New York judges who told them, no, this was the person's final wish. They didn't want you to have life insurance or, or be, you know, be the beneficiary of their life insurance, or they would have named you as beneficiary of their life insurance. You know? Right. right. Um, it's it's kind of, kind of hard for right now for you to realize that, you know, your, your spouse was cheating on you and I'm sorry for that, but this was their final wish. And so that's that, you know, um, you can take it out on them in the afterlife. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Go find them there. <laughs> and so that pretty much covers family law. Um, I do have family law and, and non-monogamy, um, as a class as well. I mean, I could sit here and go on and on and on about the potential dangers of all of that. But, um, if you are scared about something and you're in an e &M type situation, you probably have a right to be. So yeah. again, check your local laws, um, check out your, I mean, read the code section if that's what you want to do, but especially whenever it comes to family law, a lot of stuff is decided that has nothing to do with the code um, because it's case made law. And so definitely, you know, consult an attorney competent in your jurisdiction for that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that brings us to criminal. Right. Huh. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, in not many jurisdictions, is it still on the books? And in even fewer jurisdictions than that, do people actually prosecute? Right. But the two main areas you want to look into is adultery as a mm -hmm. crime, not as a cause of action for a divorce case, which is a, a civil case. <laughs> Rarely mm -hmm. are they civil but they're not criminals. So they're civil. Um, <laughs> um, and bigamy. Those are the two areas to look into. Um, there, uh, most states still have bigamy laws on their books. I don't know any that don't. Um, mm -hmm. Adultery, again, it can be actionable. It cannot be. Um, adultery is still a crime in New York, for example. It's still a crime in Georgia, um, but it's rarely, rarely ever prosecuted. Um, you know, there are some defenses, um, like in New York, it, there's, there's no prosecution for bigamy. Um, if you acted under reasonable belief that the person that you married wasn't still married, you know what I mean? Um, and I would, I would guess that in most jurisdictions that still have bigamy on the books, that would be the case. You know, like if you thought, you know, like a soap opera thing, you know, the spouse died and then they resurrect 15 years later, you know, and the other person's married and, and have kids, the, the old days of our lives trope, you know, um, but as opposed to the CSI trope where you have the one husband hopping between two families yeah, in you know, yeah. different cities, right? It's <laughs> right, right, exactly. You That's know, the bad guy. And, and they go back and forth. And God bless anybody who can do that. That seems like a lot of oh trouble. Oh my God, that sounds exhausting. Absolutely exhausting. Fuck no. Uh, and uh, so that's it's the sort of thing that you have to, to look out for. And uh, like I said, it's, it's rarely prosecuted anymore, but just be aware again, the more you know, this is what we're doing tonight. Um, and I know I mentioned landlord tenant laws being our last area, but I've already jumped over into, you know, another area um, as far as, you know, we skipped from family law and then we went to, to, to over to criminal law and now we're coming back. But um, a word about employment law and I get oh, yeah. a lot. Um, 
morality clauses. I am yes. area, the sixth area of law. Um, yeah, morality clauses. Um, a lot of people get hung up. Um, I had a doctor the other day. I was uh, teaching my BDSM in the law class, and she wrote me privately afterwards on Fet Life. She said, My God, I loved your class. It was great. Thank you. Um, I really admire the fact that you put yourself out there publicly because, y'all, when I say open out and practicing, and practicing meaning I'm not retired because my mentor who did this before me is retired. That's how we sort of delineate between the two of us. Um, but I, you can search my name, Sarah Steele, mm -hmm. by the way, there it is. Um, and I am out there on the YouTube videos talking about this and BDSM and the law and other things. Um, I designed my life like that on purpose so I didn't have to worry about morality clauses mm -hmm. at a big law firm. But this doctor wrote me, she said, I love what you're doing for the community. I would love to do that for my community, but I don't know if I can because a lot of doctors, a lot of nurses, um, especially if they work for corporations, have morality clauses. Mm -hmm. And you yeah, have to work out for that. And that it, it is very, very rare that you can get out of those. Um, and what would trigger a morality clause? Who knows? You know, what might be immoral to one person, you know, might not be immoral to another person. You know, it's kind of like Justice, I believe it was Justice Brandeis, that defined pornography as whatever that turned the judge on, you know, mm -hmm. uh, really that was uh, one of our Supreme court justices said that um, a few decades ago. And so, you know, you might have a boss that under totally understands non-monogamy or, you know, some of the other esoteric things we do, but sexual minorities are at a unique risk for being fired um, because of their relationships, you know, because even a monogamous married consensual adult relationship that happens to be two people of the same gender could be cast as immoral if under the right circumstance or wrong, I guess, circumstances, or you could have a heteronormative relationship where you have a man and a woman, he's the breadwinner. She stays home, raises the kids and all that. But if you practice a traditional 1950s household and you got domestic discipline going on in the kitchen, then you know, they consider that to be, they could consider that the employers to be immoral. And so you have to be careful with this. If you have a morality clause um, in your contracts. And so keep an eye out for that. You know, I had a friend of mine come to me and say, you know, I can't really be involved with anything in the, in the BDSM world. And, you know, and they were open and poly world anymore because I have a morality contract and she's a marketing professional. I mean, she has absolutely, you know, not like a public face. She's not like I'm the PR person. She's the one that designs all of the marketing things to put on the internet, you know, but that's just, she made sure to read her um, contracts and the paperwork. You know, everybody real eager when they get a new job, sign on the paperwork. Let me get to work. Let me get my paycheck. Let me do the thing that I love to do, but be careful and make sure you read everything because you don't want to run afoul. Um, mm -hmm like this and, and be caught with your piece down, not in a good way because, you know, you didn't even know that it was there. Um, read everything you sign, even and especially badge. People love to go to cons. I love this. I see this all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, different kink and, and e and m cons, you know, they just want to sign the papers, get the badge and go inside, you know. Mm -mm. No, make sure you read. Because what it is you might be doing in the hallway of that hotel might get you kicked out your badge revoked. You never know. So the um, the military. I'm gonna I'm gonna circle back here. So the military, from what I understand, also has something that says even if you and your spouse consent mm -hmm. to like swinging, for example, right? They can remove you and you know without your your retirement and so on and so forth oh they can court-martial you and put you in the brig <laughs> yeah so that, and that's even if both of you are in agreement if you have you know the the military has that control they have essentially the ultimate morality clause and whether or not they choose to exercise that you know they might wait until two days before you're supposed to retire and then exercise that so that's something to, to be very aware of. I don't know the statute of limitations on adultery or uh, bigamy or anything like that as far as the uniform code of uh, military justice is concerned. 
Um, I'm not a jag. I, I yeah, never, yeah. Me neither. Me neither. That. Just throwing that out there for somebody to be aware of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I did a, a podcast um, in the, the, the blog talk radio legal show. I was talking about um, a man and a woman went out, had a, thir- a threesome with a woman. Everybody was consenting. Everybody was happy. Um, and none of the three of them ratted each other out. It was actually one of them bragged to somebody who went, you know, who clutched their non-existent pearls and went and reported them. And the man was going to be court-martialed. Um, the National Coalition for Sexual Freedom actually stepped in and wrote an amicus brief on his behalf saying, look, these laws are antiquated. You need to get rid of them. Yeah. That's now, good. I don't know whatever happened in that case. Um, but yes, you're stripped of all rank. You're stripped of all benefits. You're thrown in military jail, which from what I understand, you really don't want to be in. Not that jail is, you know, a, a great place to be in. in Any the jail. <laughs> Military jail, you do not want to be in. Hey, I don't um, even like getting thrown into FET mail for sending too many messages. Right, so, like, right, exactly. you know, don't stomp on my freedoms. That's right. Um, so, you know, it's just one of those things where you have to, yeah, yeah, that's kind of where the, and then of course, once you're found to be an adulterer, you can use grounds of a court martial and a divorce if you end up divorcing the person as, as proof of the adultery that it, you know, it really did happen. So again, be careful, be careful with what you're doing, who you're doing it with and who you're telling, you know, they would have been in the clear and everything would have been groovy if they hadn't bragged about it. And I know everybody likes to brag about it. I got it. I understand. But just be careful of who it is you open your mouth to, especially when it comes to workmates, back to the morality clause, back to, you know, being potentially court-martialed and your entire career and marriage goes down the toilet because of it. So yeah, be careful y'all. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <sighs> okay. Last one, landlord and tenant law. Cause this one's interesting to me because this is actually one I don't think I've ever thought of. Yeah. And a lot of people don't. Um, I actually hadn't really thought about it myself until I started entering into uh, multi-partner relationships and I wanted them to live with me because I'm, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, for me, um, that my nesting partners, um, all be people I'm, you know, romantically and sexually involved with is just easier that way. Um, I've had partners that lived outside of my home and, and that wasn't nearly as cozy for me as actually having them there with me. Um, so what you need to be aware of in regards to landlord tenant law is that in some jurisdictions, this is definitely true in Georgia, um, they can legally limit the number of people that are unrelated by blood living in a household. Um, federal law says two per bedroom. So federal law always trumps state law always. So if you have a two bedroom apartment and you have six people living there, that's a problem. You add children into that, it gets even thicker of a problem. So in a two bedroom apartment, federal law says you're only supposed to have two adults per bedroom or two people per bedroom. Um, Mm -hmm. So that can limit if your polycule is large, where it is that you can reside. And, you know, even if you don't start out as a big polycule, as you expand, you run the risk because people think, oh, well, just come and live with me. I'll be the first one to tell you. I will be the first one to tell you we did it in this house we're living in right now. Um, Mm -hmm. I was in a relationship with Master Inferno um, and another person. And whenever Sir Amber came into the picture, I just thought the polycule was going to expand. Um, But other partner decided that he couldn't deal with it. And so he left. And so fortunately space cleared up (laughs) for Sir Amber to move in with us. (laughs) Um, But we never told our landlord. The only reason why our landlord knew that other partner left is other partner decided to write them and tell them. And I was mm-hmm. like, what was the point in that? We're still going to pay rent. What point? But anyway, not that my drama is at all relevant here, except for the fact that, um, you know, we still had another adult come in, but mm-hmm. even we didn't tell the landlord, Hey, this is what we're doing. Why? Not because disobeying what lady Steele says in regards to the law. Um, although I am a lawyer without a will, so don't ask. Um, <laughs> it's true. It's, it's like a mechanic. Oh, the cobbler's that's children hard. have no shoes. Isn't that? Yeah, that's exactly it. A mechanic that doesn't have a car that runs, you know? Um, 
But because we were already planning on moving um, to a better school district for my son. And so uh, Sir moved in last November and it's taken us this long to find a house and we're renovating and all this. And so at the end of the month, we're moving finally. Um, you know, and our landlord was kind of chill about it. They didn't care as long as they got the rent money. We're not tearing up the house, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but at the same time, it might not be that situation. So be careful. Mm -hmm. You know, if you start off, you know, let's say as two and then you expand and expand and expand. Don't just automatically assume that you everybody can just move in to, you know, a lot of people don't do that with apartments, but they do that with houses if the houses are bigger, you know. Oh, yeah, come on in. We've got a den that we can turn into a bedroom. That'll be fine. Read your lease. Read your lease. Most of the time they don't allow that. And especially if you live in a market, again, I did this class for um, folks in New York um, with expensive and scarce housing. This can be especially dangerous if you start out as a couple, you turn into a throuple or, you know, so on and so forth. You know, your polycule blues, um, which is yay for you, but might not be yay for your situation, especially at the housing market is where, you know, if you get kicked out of your apartment, that's a lot of homelessness for a lot of people. And it's no laughing matter. And oh, yeah. so that's what I tell people to be super careful. You know, when you finally become shack up honeys, um, in your polytype situation, make sure you have the deposits available and the new house available or the new place to live available or whatever. Um, now keep in mind, this is landlord tenant law. This does not apply if you own your own house. If you own your own house, stack them up like cordwood if that's what you wanna do. Just be aware that the only thing you might run afoul of is zoning laws if you end up with stuff and garbage and everything running out your front door, you know, cause you got so many people. Um, I like six or seven subs piled against the wall, just waiting for my next right, order. Right, exactly. Um, so, you know, really, in in all reality, home ownership is definitely advantageous mm -hmm. in a situation like that. But um, again, be aware of who can be on the mortgage versus who can be on the deed. Um, mm -hmm. You can usually have more people on the deed than you can the mortgage. Um, and in the event that they're not on the mortgage or on the deed, make sure they're taken care of with your estate planning. You will have listened to Lady Steele. Your life will be a lot easier. <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> and with the moral of that story. Right, right. <laughs> you know, I've been reading off of uh, multiple sets of notes. So, yeah, I'm hoping that I covered everything. Do you have any questions that you think the, um, the good folks that are watching this might have? No, no. Actually, I think my brain has been filled up beyond capacity for the <laughs> evening. Thank um, you. Have it recorded. I think I think what I'm what I'm taking away from this is listen to Lady Seal and your life will be better, which which <laughs> sounds know, very similar to what I, I tell people. Just, I just really say, if I was on the left side of the slash, that would like be on yeah. my paper sticker. That would be right. on a T-shirt. But I alas, as I said, I uh, I have Sir Amber. She tells me what to do, and uh, occasionally she does what I tell her to, which is very rare. But fortunately, she's smart enough to know that when it comes to legal stuff, you might want to listen to Lady Steele. I, you know, I think that that's an important um, part of being the D type or top letter or whatever it is in a relationship is understanding the skill set that you have at your disposal. See, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, I have been preaching that for decades now. And uh, I've been very lucky. Master Inferno was willing to do that. And Saramba is definitely willing to do that. You know, she yeah. and I are like crackers and toast, you know, because <laughs> she doesn't like paperwork and it's triggery for her. And that's all I do for a living. And then yesterday in our house renovation, she changed out a wax wing on a toilet. I'm standing two rooms away, grossing out at the thought of the, I mean, our house is a hundred years old at the hundred years worth of bacteria that's in it, you know, <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're like, you're like, it's like drilling down through Antarctica. Yeah. You're letting loose some virus that hasn't been seen in the world. That's right. That's right. The new coronavirus. That's how it got started. Now we know. Um, but yeah, no. So we're, we're very well matched, very well suited for one another because we definitely take advantage of the other person's skill set. So, you know, there's your free poly advice for the night. <laughs> And people that compliment you and add to you. So well, you know, the the joke in, in poly and non monogamy, right, is is choose the partners that have the um subscriptions that you want. You've right. got Netflix, you've got Amazon Prime. <laughs> Disney Plus, where are you? Yeah. <laughs> I need a Hulu. Who's got a Hulu? Right. Hulu. Who has Hulu? That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's um 
It's funny. The the many things, you know, like what we're, we're recording this, you know, obviously this is a dating kinky production. We're recording this, you know, specifically for non-monogamy. So, you know, there's going to be people who are going to, to listen to this and who are going to um, be specifically non-monogamous, but not kinky. Right. And they're going to be listening to us going, what a bunch of weirdos, right? <laughs> we are. We are. We, we are in, in, in a lot of ways. And yet, um, I, I, I liken it to the whole, the swingers versus the kinksters, right? right. You got both groups giving each other the side eye. <laughs> like, they're just like having sex all over the place. They're hitting each other. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've got like the people who are like, kind of like, you know, that Venn diagram. And here we are like in the middle kind of going, um, it's all fun. What and then it? I offer the class of multiple <laughs> partners and, and uh, power exchange dynamics. So, yeah, yeah, and you know that's actually yeah. probably something we should you know bring in. We're we've got. Um, are you familiar with Miss Betty? Yes. Okay, so Miss Betty's coming in, and she's doing um, kink and polyamory intersection. So um, that was something I definitely wanted to bring into the mix. Yeah. Uh, just because, you know, I know that there are a lot of people who I particularly reach yeah. who are going to have those kind of dynamics, um, and like cuckolding and non-monogamy or, or whatever, they're not quite normal. Right. And in many polyamory or non-monogamy, uh, groups, they're actually shunned. Because, you know, if, if, if you're in a power exchange, right, and you can tell somebody, no, you're not allowed to do that, or no, you're not allowed to do them, yeah. that's anathema to most of the poly community. Absolutely. Right? So yeah. unicorn hunting in the kink world is something completely different yeah. than hunting in the poly world, which is bad and horrible and you shouldn't do it. Yeah. We got that lesson here about the last year. Um because I was talking about unicorn hunting from my perspective, you know, I've been kinking my whole life. And people were like, oh, no, that's evil. And I'm like, well, what What if you've got a dom or two or a sub or two thrown in there? What do you do? Well, they didn't have a clue. You know, yeah. they didn't have a clue. And I even found that in my particular prior relationship dynamics, I was given a lot of side eye depending on what area of the world I was in. At Test oh. Fest, you and I oh, yeah. at Test Fest, you know. Um, up in New York, it wasn't. I was in a V type relationship with Master Inferno and Lord Fenrir, where they're both my like one was a master, one was a dominant, but they were both my left siders or tops. And mm -hmm. you know, I was the the fulcrum of the V, and people didn't understand that. Yes, you can absolutely do that, and yeah. I think it also kind of blew the circuit of the mind of the people in the South because it was two men sharing one woman. Now you can be a woman and have multiple men. You can have a man that has multiple women and that's fine, but two men sharing one woman like that, it just really, it did not compute with them. And so that's where my class was born out of because I was asked more times than I could ever care to count. How does that work now? I completely get like as a dominant, the yeah. idea of another dominant, right? messing with that because that is mine right like i'm not jealous i pimp him out but mine right, right. like oh yeah i can feel it Ooh. yeah see and now in the v that i have because sir amber and master inferno are not sexual with each other they don't have power to make with each other so but he's my daddy we have a daddy girl relationship she is my dominant we have you know well dominant girl for now she's a master in training because I identify as slave. And um, so they have to be considerate of one another. You know, she has to defer to him for caregiving at times. He has to defer to her. You know, he sits here with his mouth agog, one of my favorite words. Um, I like agog. That's a good word. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Especially uh, for only four letters. That says a lot in four it letters. Does. It does. It does. Um, but yeah, he's a gog quite a bit at the fact that she now commands me to do stuff or just tells me to do stuff. And I'm like right there. And he's like, well, why the hell didn't she do that with me? You know? And it, you know, the simple answer to that is different people, different dynamics, but yeah, you can still tell there's a little, you know, mm -hmm. thoughts, you know, issues that go through the head and 
you know, there's certain ways that that has to be handled. And, you know, those of us that have gone through the hard knocks of that, you know, can certainly impart our knowledge because my V with Master Inferno or Daddy and, and Sir is vastly different than the that I had with two straight men in a relationship with me. Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I mean, the, the testosterone is real in that situation. And even Sir Amber has more testosterone than some men, most men I know actually, but she still has the ability to communicate with daddy to where that's not so much of a problem. Um, right. When you have two men that are being competitive, you know, it, it was, it was hard at times. It was hard on me a lot. Yeah. I can imagine. don't want to get in the middle of that, you know? I, I don't I don't think anybody would want to get in the middle of me being right. actively competitive with somebody. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That well, I mean, and 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 when ownership is such a huge part of my sexuality, for example, that is, you know. Um, but all of that aside, chit chat aside, uh, yeah, so you know, I I did wanna I did wanna um talk about non-monogamy in the law. And I'm glad that, you know, we got to touch a little bit on, you know, the side effects of kink and so on and so forth. And this has been for me, um, really educational. There's, I mean, there's, there's some things I've like kind of thought of, right. And sort of, you know, okay. And I've, I've really, you know, for years, my assistant and I have been talking about, you know, there needs to be something really put together, like a really good primer for the poly people the non-monogamous people out there to know what to ask yeah. their legal counsel. And well, and then know to go to a legal counsel to ask these things as their lives begin to complicate this way. Yeah. Um, and that's, <clears throat> and this is just the perfect, you know, answer to that because this gives everybody the opportunity to say, oh, well, this is something I should ask. And maybe in my state, it's not currently an issue or it's not something that applies to me. But if I ask, then at least I'll know it's covered. Absolutely. And that's so incredibly critical. Um, and so the next stage of this is, you know, once this is out and we get through this ginormous weekend of non-monogamy times a gazillion, um, then we're going to be taking questions. So wherever this video is posted, um, you can access Attorney Lady Steele. You'll be able to access me, put in comments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we'll be taking questions. And in a couple of weeks, we don't have a set date yet, but in a couple of weeks, probably after you've gotten to move, because, you know. I have to move and I have a, a tiny bit of surgery coming up. <laughs> in time, so, <laughs> But, you know, in, in, in a couple of weeks, you know, we're going to come back maybe a month, maybe maybe two months, but we're going to come back and we're going to take all of those questions that you have. And then we're going to do this live where we're going to take those questions. We're going to answer them and we'll have attendees in chat, just like our, our live um, non monogamy events. And that will be able to ask for additional clarification and get a little bit deeper into, you know, some of these things that you know we've touched on here and and, and maybe get some more specifics maybe hear a few more legal stories which is kind of like gossip that we don't know the people about which is right. fun. um yeah so thank you so so very much um tell the people uh how they can reach you again so that yes they absolutely um uh, if you're on fet life um attorney lady steel is my handle there um, otherwise, you can find me on Facebook. If you search Sarah Steele, three E's, not all in the row, S-T-E-E-L-E, -E -E, um, and the word Atlanta, then usually you will see me with much better colored hair since I haven't had my hair colored in a minute because of COVID. Um, <laughs> we're taking care of that soon, let's hope. Been there, done that, you know. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, you can find me there. Um, if nothing else, you can definitely find my um, business page there. Um, I might not friend you if I don't know you, but I will definitely um, reach me on Facebook Messenger. And you know what? If all else fails, call me or text me. My number is 404-939-6716. I can be found. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. This has been a real joy and so much good information that 
And I have to tell you this, she does this, she did this for us pro bono. She did this for you pro bono. And we are putting this out there to the world to share this information. So no matter where you are, I mean, I'm guessing there's going to be people from all around the world, from different countries, watching this and learning from this. So wherever you are, don't hesitate to share anything you might know about your own jurisdictions. Absolutely. But also, hopefully this will, you know, the, the language will be different probably if you're in the UK or if you're in Australia or Thailand or you know, some place that, you know, obviously doesn't speak English, but the principles mm -hmm. can help guide you in what to look for and the potential stumbling blocks that yeah. you might find building your non-monogamy life. And um, that's the part that I really, really wanted to get touched on here is for all of you. So thank you. All right, it was my pleasure to serve as always. Thank you for having me. Yay!